It is March the 22nd, 2021, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. And the whole team is back with uh, part two of our workflow series. Yay! <laughs> I actually I I initially when when we when we thought about doing this I was like yeah that might be boring but I, it turned out to be anything but boring so here's the second part because we didn't finish it there was too much stuff going on someone mm -hmm. yeah. took up took, took up all the time <laughs> how's how is everyone doing today not yeah, pretty good. Bad. It's been a nice yeah. spring day here today, yep. actually. Nice, it's Monday, nice then. Yeah. Mild, get out in the sunshine a bit. <clears throat> yeah. So we. Yeah, we're in. Va we're in, We're good here. Vaccination heaven. <sighs> Not quite the same here in uh, no, Central here. Europe. So, so we're here. we are. We are still fighting to get stuff delivered. Whatever. It's going to happen in time. We killed more people here, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we should bother about things Swings that. and roundabouts. Yeah, there's, it's not a competition. <sighs> no, not really. Oh, no. <laughs> so anyway, we have workflows to talk about and we are um, going to do that starting with whom? Who, who, wants to, who wants to get started? Well, I think Emer should go. Yeah, me too. So Emer, you, <laughs> uh, you uploaded a few photos to go along with your workflows. Okay, so I uploaded three photos because I just, I suppose, three different ways I would maybe um, approach things. So um, if you want to start with the flower one there, which is probably everyone's favorite kind of an edit, which is no edit. So that one was straight out of the camera with halide on a slow, slow shutter and I'm um, just moving it around. So um, I was really, really, really happy with the way this came out. Like, why would you want to do anything to that now? You wouldn't, uh, <laughs> which doesn't happen to me very often, I have to say. <laughs> did you, do, do, you um, do a straight output from the um, phone? Yeah, 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 I did. So you didn't take it? Mm -hmm. into I actually posted it. I posted it the other day on Instagram and I did edit it a tiny little bit. Well, I, I more cropped it really than anything and I brightened it up a teeny weeny bit. But, so that is part of um, the workflow. I do like it in its original. It is. <laughs> That, well, well no, because sure this, the one I'm choosing here. to show you now is the one that <laughs> I'm choosing to show you is is the raw one, just because um, I was just so happy with the way that came out. It looks like something's yeah. been done to it, but honestly, it hasn't. But I, I did take about 50 photographs <laughs> <laughs> to get that one. Um, yeah. I like how how it's like how it's very um, it's 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 abstract, but at the same time you still have a very good idea of what it is, and even a bit of an yeah. idea of, of the process. Have you tried? Yeah, yeah, and I even like flopping it around. That green in the corner. Have you tried? I d it doesn't look right. Uh, it, it doesn't look right. I tried it every which way. Let me let me try just, here. Let me try here. Look, it looks wrong. Can yeah. I turn this. No, I I, I feel it looks wrong. 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 Yeah, I, I sometimes do this with these kind of photos. I try them in different orientations, and yeah. uh, there's always one that works better than wrong? the others. Yeah, I think it's because of the way I was probably pulling the camera. You know, uh, it, it, it's just it, that's the way I was pulling the camera, so it works that way. But if you turn it upside down, it looks like I don't know. It looks wrong. So for uh, just... for the audio only, <laughs> we're looking at an abstraction of a. Mm. of a flower that looks like uh, we are moving into it or away from it uh, at speed. So it's very abstracted. Um, it's yeah. it's like a color field painting. It's like, actually, I, uh, there's horizontal and vertical movement in it, which I kind of like, especially there at the bottom, at the center of the flower. Um, I particularly like that bit, actually. And you know, as I was talking about previously, if I was to take maybe a detail from this, I'd take that section and try and do something with that. And in um, terms of slow to, shutters, you know, which is further a, the work. Uh, you know, a topic for another day, I think, um, and, and the uses of ND to provide a, a right expo the correct exposure for slow shutters. Um, mm. Don't you find that on your camera, it would be so easy for us to, or for 
Apple or Samsung, or whoever, <laughs> to put in ND filters, just one, two, three, electronic. Oh, you, you mean you mean you mean a little hardware ND be, filter yeah. that flips into the, <laughs> in front of the lens? No, no. <laughs> yeah, no. That would be no, no, amazing. No, can, <laughs> that would be I, I the very steampunk. Electronic ND filters now, don't there, they? In, in there are cameras. Sure. Their cameras. Certainly, we find that in film yeah. cameras or in digital uh, <laughs> capture. Uh, cameras um, often now they have um, NDs that you can dial in electronically. Yeah. Um, the, uh, mm. Actually, the, the, uh, when I had the Fuji X100, which I had the original one of many years ago, uh, that had a built-in three-stop ND filter as well. You could just click it into place. Mm. It was great. I think there's not much, well, not much actual... space in a in a smartphone to put a proper ND, a real ND filter. In <laughs> that, uh, no, and no, the, an AI, the, AI. No. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's, it's something. Yeah, no, <laughs> not, it's not the same. But it, nothing in those uh, phone cameras are the same. They're when all it, emulations. The when it comes to ND filters, I'm a. But it'll probably purist. do the job. <laughs> you only use good glass. <laughs> yes. <Maybe>. So that, <laughs> yes. Okay. So that's so, number one. Anyway, which moving is, on. I think everyone's Next. favorite kind of edit. Um, the second, if you go to the one on the left, then the kind of landscapey one with the tree in it. Yeah. So what's the workflow on this one? Classic. My classic pretty sky, picture. Sky um, halide again. Um, just took down the exposure a bit at the start to kind of bring out some of the sky a bit. And then... It, like I kind of tend to hover over and back. I suppose it's kind of intuitive or something. I don't really think too much about it. Um, I'll st always start in Snapseed, like I said last week. So that was where it would have started. Well, uh, that was where it would have started out. And then I fix the exposure a bit in there. Then I take it into that went into mixtures and I played about with it in there because I like the... Um, I like the, the control that you can have in there as well with textures, but very, very subtle textures. So there's a few of those on there, but you can't really see them. And then uh, back into Snapseed again, I think I flip flopped over a few times uh, between bows. And then uh, there's a little crop at the very end um, just to take the very wide look off it. Um, so... Yeah, that's number two. Uh, can uh, I ask just you? Put, uh, when, I like, when you. Yeah, yeah. Snapseed, where, what do you use in Snapseed? Well, since I've started using the Halide, obviously the first place it pulls in that you can play with your exposure in there. And um, usually the contrast in there as well, a little bit. I kind of sometimes like a lot of contrast in them. Um, uh, then I will take it into uh, the tune image for, and I'll mess about with it in there. I like to play around the details, so I'll try and pull out the details, but by degrees, if you know what I mean. So not all in the one, not all in the one um, movement, if that makes any sense. Um, and then when. Yeah, and then when, when I've got to that level, then I'll pull it into mixtures and I'll start kind of applying the kind of uh, texture type things on the top of that and um, maybe gradient sometimes. Uh, but the, the the kind of actual, um, what are they called? <laughs> I don't even know the, the kind of textures, the grungy filters. Yeah. Um, I use those a lot. And then and there's vintage gradients in there. They're quite nice. And also um, because you can do the different modes, you know, um, the color dodge and burn, it's hard on the phone to get down to it's all or nothing kind of. It's a bit like that. But if you if you kind of hit it at the right, sometimes you just find that thing. But then I find sometimes if I've um, I've worked it a bit in mixtures, I take it back into Snapseed for the very final um, tweak about with it. So I might go back into tune image in there again. I might. Um, maybe fade it back a little bit sometimes even when i'm um, posting it on instagram then i might well i heard somebody say that even um 
Instagram, its algorithm likes if you apply an Instagram filter to it. So obviously some of them are a bit <laughs> they, clunky. They reward and, you by giving you, know, you a better rating. So if, a you, if you leave if you it down that, to, yes. you know, if you, you put it on, but you just leave it at like 1%, <laughs> yes. it still reads that it's there and um, it doesn't really affect your picture. So, so, so uh, you know, I do have, that a bit I as have well. A is that, for you, is that, this is, is a, that true? This is a big mm-hmm. process that you've got here. Yeah, I read that somewhere. And I've done it ever since. <laughs> so, yeah. This is, this is a big process you've got going on here, email. So my, my question or my brain is thinking, well, how, how do you decide? What is it that drives you to choose the the, the changes that you make? Um, well, I, I know in this particular one, there's a red iron bridge in the distance there. I'm way too far away from it. And even with all my twiddling about, you can only just about see it now. That looks absolutely gorgeous there. But the closer I got to the actual bridge, it's really um, littered, unfortunately. Um, So it just, the whole look was gone. (laughs) So um, obviously I couldn't get any closer to the bridge without capturing the litter. So yeah, it really does. It really does. Um, That was actually at the back of the doctor's surgery. I had my daughter at the doctor on Friday. So that was a completely... Random. I, I just I, I, I'm not down there very often, but it's very close to my home place. So um, I live quite near the river, but this isn't the main river. This is like a back river that um, you can't see because it's all hidden. So unless you go down the back of this, uh, all these houses down this lane, um, you never really see the back river. And often um, you can be lucky enough to find a whole bunch of swans down there. We didn't, unfortunately, <laughs> the other day. But um, yeah. So where that, you can see a steeple in the distance um, uh, there of a church and literally that's my home, my home place. So, uh, yeah, I thought it was just a lovely angle. Um, Obviously, the yellow daffodils caught my attention and the curve of the fence. And uh, I really love that hill the way it like if you look at any of my pictures, that hill is in it quite a bit. So, um, yeah, it's just. And then it just when it feels right, then it's finished. You know, uh, yeah, that's the, that for me is sometimes like something I struggle with. It's like when when to stop. <laughs> it's like when just yeah, sometimes look, I sometimes I totally over egg the pudding. <laughs> Um, but that's that's, yeah, that's why everybody I, doesn't. <laughs> that's why I put myself yeah. under under time pressure, so I have to stop at one point. There is a deadline yeah. built uh-huh. in into some yeah. of my processes. Well, I think my daily challenge does that to me now at the moment. I think that, like, I do have to kind of stop at some point. Jeremiah, you know, and there's a limited amount of time. One of the things that that I find is good is as is a, as you're editing is just saving out uh, your edits uh, mm-hmm. when you're happy mm-hmm. with them, but are still obsessed with the process, so that when you yeah. get to the, is this even recognizable <laughs> from <laughs> where I began? You go like, no, yeah. but you could have like three or four or five pictures that are all step towards uh, shifts, and often you like two of them for very different reasons. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. good, good I tip think for if you that, go then, radically in terms of your your edits, it's it's kind of fun. Yeah, a good tip mm. for yeah. that if you Just if you have that keep as part saving of your workflow. it as as you go. Yeah, and you know, Snapseed yeah. is really really good in that way as well because even when you save it out, um, it keeps all your um, edits, and you can go back and kind of tweak it just a tiny bit without having to go through the entire process again or figuring out, oh, how did I get here? You know, you can go right back in and trace all your steps to the beginning. All right. Any other workflows from your site that we need to talk about? There are two more pictures, but those are from Adrian, right? Yeah, there's one more there belonging to me, which is the, the very dark, the very silhouette looking one. Oh, that one. <laughs> Before I um, see. Adrian's little girly. Yeah. So that is like over egging the pudding in, on purpose. Uh, <laughs> so that started off as um oh you know what it was it was one of those um night the night we were trying to capture the night shots yes and i, I was really disappointed with this because it came out so bright um so i it was the detail in that picture that was the the kind of tower and the kind of town walls are in it 
Um, so I brought it into hipstomatic, into the new hipstomatic, which put those sort of scratchy lines on it, which made it sort of look like um, etched or drawn on or something. And I kind of like that. So then it went into Snapseed. Then it went into Mixtures. <laughs> then it went back into Snapseed again. I just played about with it and I just kept adding sort of layers of texture. And I really like that red, um, that like red, red in the background. It looks and a bit like a light leak in a, in a, in a <clears throat> film, in film photography. Yeah, it is a light leak. Yeah, it is a light leak yeah, for see. mixtures. And um, yeah. Emer, uh, but I, yeah, I'm just gonna, layered I'm going to say you are such a good candidate for uh, Photoshop or Lightroom or Luminar. Yeah, I, you're I, a I very thought, good yeah. candidate for it because some of your instincts will be very welcome in those kind of, I, I want to say, closed um, circuits of editing. Um, and especially as you like to over egg the pudding, you can do so in <laughs> layers so that you can yeah. always remove one egg or even a half a yolk. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that, that when you're editing, on Photoshop initially, the instinct is to overdo Maybe it Maybe I'm all wrong the time. about this, but I just always think of um, sitting down to open up Photoshop as uh, I'm going to be there for hours. No, and I need, you your... know, I, I generally don't, and I would be there for hours because I would get completely into mm. it. But I, I just don't have that kind of time right now. Well, that's a different <laughs> so story. <laughs> I tend to avoid it for those reasons, probably, because I know I'll get sucked in. I'm kind of with you, um, uh, Ema, because the yeah. you know, sometimes I think you know I, I want to do some stuff, but you know it feels such overkill sometimes, and sometimes I just don't want to sit at a desk in front of a computer. I want to sit because you do so much of it already, you know, and just sketch stuff on <laughs> yeah. my iPad. You know, do my ad edits on an iPad yeah. or on a phone or yeah. something like that. So I do have quite a lot of inertia when it comes to using high-powered editing tools. <laughs> And that's, I think as and that's well, why I love deadlines. Whole, um, that's why I love deadlines. <laughs> I'm still a bit traumatized from probably like um, college assignments, even though like I'm out of it five years this year. I think I'm still a little traumatized from the level of um, work and like I, I can still. <laughs> so it's the same machine I'm using as well. So, <laughs> well, so, so people who are listening and, and trying to figure out how does this really uh, work for the future of photography and, and workflow editing, I, I mean, we can, we can like really me. say that, that a lot of our decision making in terms of editing could be related to time constraints or time availability um, mm. to the actual project we're doing. So, for example, if you need mm. to post something within a half an hour – uh, or deliver it to a client, then then it will require one kind of set of skills and tools, um, and and we will basically be m much more efficient about how we do it, and maybe even leave off where we're at. Whereas mm -hmm. if we're just exploring an image and what we can do in terms of pushing it to where it almost doesn't even look like the original capture, that's a whole different experience mm. for us. And we can choose mm. our tools very, very, sorry for the crank call here. No worries. Um, we, can, we can choose our, our, our tools based on time and output and, and all of those things. So I, I do think that that, that is a, um, uh, one of the benefits of being able to use many different tools. Absolutely. And I think, you know what, if I was doing work for anybody professionally in terms of photography, I would not be probably using my phone to do it. It's just it, that's not the way it is for me now. But um, if I ever was, I I'll obviously would be taking it straight to um, Lightroom and Photoshop to do my edits on it and, and not to my phone or my iPad, probably. Um, but that doesn't uh, that doesn't really happen. <laughs> So um, I'm not in the market for that, so it's fine. Like it's just I'm I'm only pleasing myself. I'm not I'm not doing it for anybody else. So it's mm -hmm. just play, but the, the question, of course, is is mm -hmm. are you? I mean, you you're doing this for yourself, but um, would you be more happy if you if you had this kind of wrapped in projects in that way end up creating more output as opposed to spending so much on one photo? Yeah. 
I, that, I don't know. Would that change actually. something? I don't know. Um, d- d- well, definitely if I was, um, if my work was sort of more geared towards, I'm still trying to figure out a way because I do like, I suppose I, I'm kind of prolific in, in my um, amateurism, but, and I know there's something to it all, but, and, and like, what does it become? I don't know, but um, sure. All the time in the world to find out. So. But Chris, Chris brings up a very good point. When you're editing a movie, for example, generally <laughs> you will have a release schedule, and you that's are a hard always date working for against yeah. a very tough yeah. t- timeline. Yeah, and and and, and yeah. so so yeah. your end date for editing is on your date that you must deliver it, and there is yeah. no generally backing off of that. And so a yeah. lot of your decision making and how it turns out is based on the the calendar because but you know you, know, uh, you the, could I, which brings on. me back to the trauma of the college assignments and like <laughs> trying to make animations and things that are really time heavy uh, in short spaces of time with limited knowledge of your tools uh, i'm still traumatized <laughs> so and you know what, what and, I, like, find I don't have like i enjoy not having deadlines right what what i find um with uh, the workflow uh in photography is that i can clearly split my photography into two kind of major directions and one is the yeah the snapshot the around the house kind of photography um mm. or being on vacation just having the camera with me and the this aimless walking around, shooting things and playing with them, um, where there is no kind of a, a prescribed workflow for me, which I just do whatever feels right. And I love doing that, mm. even though I end, I tend to fiddle too much and then end up with like spending too much time on one photo and maybe not uh, <laughs> not noticing that there are like 20 really good ones still not looked at. And then there's the more process driven one where um, we talked about this last time, the travel photography for me, where I cannot really afford to build up a backlog because then it's over. Mm. Um, where, mm. or the, or the process driven film photography, there is a workflow, but the, 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 the medium itself prescribes a workflow. And um, that's especially clear mm-hmm. when you look at something like large format photography, where you are, you cannot afford mistakes because with half of the mistakes that you can make, you will just not have a photo at the end. So <laughs> right. it's very easy to completely mess it up. So yeah. um, there's a workflow built into that or or being on a deadline, as in having a project, a book, something, an article working on and um, where I have a very clear vision, what I need. I know exactly what I need and what it's going to look like and what, what, what background and what lighting and what uh, what aesthetic the photo has to have, and I work towards that. And there's a deadline. And during making, getting getting off my bum doing it is tough. But then once it's rolling, once it's going, then I end up having fun doing it. And of course, the end result mm. is uh, is is wonderful. But well, at least is usually what I want to get out. But it's mm-hmm. a very limited scope. But this is kind of the two Adri- main two main directions. The one is the a- work- Adrian is. <laughs> I think is your <laughs> workflow based on your resistance to sitting in front of a computer because that's what you're <laughs> yeah. doing uh, so much during the day. So that your choice of tools is basically to get out from under that. Awesome. That there there could well be a grain of truth in that um i I hadn't really thought about it in in those terms but but certainly certainly that could be part of it i think for me it's i I, i'm just incredibly lazy and so you know (laughs) i like to have i I like to have a a you know as little friction in these processes as possible you know, so it's it, and th- that's because I've been, you know, and as I've spoken about before, you know, I did get to a point where there was way too much friction. I owned too many cameras and couldn't decide what to do and, and things like that. And so, you know, uh, you know, the last couple of years for me has been a, a process of trying to reduce the friction to a, as close to zero as possible. Mm. Take out the, uh, uh, but what's it called? The analysis paralysis? Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah there's a bit a bit of that um or or just simply that you know i don't know whether you 
you know, you give credence to you know the the online philosophers, especially the mil- the minimalist you know gurus who say, well, you know, if you have too many decisions to make, you'll get decision fatigue and things like that. It's <laughs> it's just you know, just wanted to make life a bit simpler, really, and 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 go that way. And if you can, if I can do everything you know on one device or or just a few devices you know uh, if i can you know take a few shots do a little bit of editing either on my phone or my ipad and then print them out wirelessly to a printer that's just you just switch and plug switch it on and and send the files to it and not worry about it too much and see what comes out and yeah it's just it's just that really um i'm the opposite yeah, and, and it's a really interesting... You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> For me, if, if, if it's too easy, if there's no friction, I feel I'm not pushing the boundaries um, personally and, and, and technically and aesthetically. I, I like there to be friction because I like to move through it and I like to often discover things that are very different than I thought I would discover by pushing through. Ah, see, and the difference so between will... you and I, Jeremiah, is that you have talent, right? So you, your talent can carry you through the friction. <laughs> talent is I just d- keep <laughs> banging your have... head against the wall. I That's think the friction advice. can yeah. be quite, can, can help reveal things that you wouldn't any other yeah, way. Yeah, is what I'm saying. The pain That's helps. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I think it does. Oh, yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, for you know, we we'll talk about printing uh, in another session. Uh, but uh, you know, my my printer died, and um, this is a big deal for me because it's not like oh, I just get another printer. This is a printer, as as you know, I use piezography. It has to be converted. I need an outdoor an outboard processing. Uh, card that I have to adapt and you know I have to basically open up the printer and readjust it and get the it's a deal Um, but Mm -hmm. in so doing I learn more and more and more about the micro decisions of manipulating images um, because the printer that I I want is no longer manufactured I have to get an older version that works but Mm -hmm. uh, but again the process itself uh, helps me understand in a much deeper way what I'm up against in terms of realizing whatever intention I start out with. So um, I like friction. Hmm. All right. Um, hmm. So, Imar, quick check on time with you. You have a bit of a deadline yeah, today. We, I do, but we need to get we need to get to Adrian's pictures. Yes, we do. So, um, so Adrian, Adrian that. yours. Your Let's photos are, <laughs> let me bring them up. Here we go. You so, have two pictures up here. I have, but they both, the, the same story fits both of them, actually. So uh, these are two, two photos in this case, one, one of my daughter that you're showing now, and the, and the next one is of my son. And these are, these are my sci-fi themed portraits. <laughs> Oh. Right. So, th- so this is an instance where a rare instance where I had an idea ahead of time uh, and uh, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make some uh, some sci fi themed portraits of the kids and see if they think those are fun. And uh, so the workflow elements of that really were related to having a, a theme in mind. And I was going with the whole sort of lens flare and uh, you know, ca- kind of uh, approach. Uh, and uh, so what you have here are two, two base photographs, um, uh, are both, I believe, taken on a phone. Don't ask me which one, because I don't know. Um, and uh, then processed uh, really, uh, it, it actually did process slightly differently. So, so the, both of them, I suspect, will have gone through Snapseed first, but but one with a heavier touch. So the one you're showing here of my son, this is this was pretty much or, almost straight out of camera, apart from but the that uh, lens flare is added. Later. Apart from the flare, yeah, yeah. I'd love to see the original. So the original it was. So what happened? This this is story behind this image is that I, I I was just chatting to him one evening. It happened. There's a the, where that that flare is coming from. There's actually a window there in the real world, and and the light in his eye that is kind of lighting up the white of his eyes. Okay. Um, that yeah. was that was real. That was just there, and I spotted it. You know, when you spot a light and it catches you, and you think, wow, that's a really great light. I was just like, hold still, boy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, gonna take a photograph. <laughs> Don't move. 
don't move don't move yeah don't move yeah exactly that exactly that and uh and so and and that then um became the, the sci-fi themed you know the bass shot uh and and i tried to add in a a a a synthetic flare that that, ref, that that was motivated by the light that was in the shot already, um, and and just to give it that whole kind of yeah, well, well just a just a sort of you know J J Abrams kind of a look if you like, <laughs> but uh, and then the one of Ellie, the other photograph that was yeah d- different. That was more deliberate, taken outdoors, trying to find a, a, a you know, some something you know uh, behind. I asked her to give me a moody look. Um, which is not difficult for her <laughs> and uh, she's quite good at them and this one's had a bit more treatment in snapseed and especially with a white balance gradient so you'll notice that it's very warm on one side of the image and quite cool and blue on the other side of the image even on her face um, and so what i've done there is i've painted in a white balance adjustment with a mask um, to provide that that color switch, which is a, a a trick I use occasionally when I want to play with the balance of, of colors across an image, and then I was able to put in again, you know, in the, in the real world, the the sun was was uh, reasonably um, in the same direction as the the flare that mm-hmm. I've added. Uh, so so it, the flare that I've added fits with the way the light falls across her face. So and that's it, Reese. Really. You- you saying sci-fi f- uh, themed um, congratulations because for me you have completely hit that goal because oh, well, thank um, you. when I saw these photos before mm-hmm. you even talked yeah. about them especially with this photo I get this strange vibe of a of I don't know 1970s <laughs> sci-fi with like you know she, she might yeah. have been ab- abducted yeah. and replaced by an alien <laughs> the way she looks and the way the light mm-hmm. is and everything mm-hmm. looks kind of slightly Definitely. unreal so that there, there is a, a bit of that very in the intense calling. yes very intense yes well thank you very much yeah it's, they're great I think it's models, a beautiful actually. they're very image. comfortable aren't they yeah so if you had a spaceship instead of a soccer net in the back <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe it is a spaceship <laughs> it's just really very <laughs> well disguised you know uh, yes, there's no, the, the, yes. There's a soccer net there in the back. You can't see in the background of the cricket nets, and then just off to the just outside the camera shot is the local pub. So that uh, <laughs> often, as as ever with composition, it's what you exclude rather than what you include that's important, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so very very cool. They're great. So thank you. I think I think sure. that's. That, sorry, go ahead, Jeremiah. I, I was just going to say, as a summation, do, do do we want our workflows to be um, effortless, or do we want our workflows to involve uh, <laughs> steps that improve uh, our ability to control what output we have, or both? And, I, and I definitely go with the, the latter. It doesn't have to be effortless, despite what I said a few minutes ago. But do you know what? I think we, we are lucky to live in a time when so many such powerful and so diverse tools are available to us so mm, so okay. easily and so inexpensively. Mm. I mean, the fact that you can pick and choose an image making workflow depending upon what idea you have in your head is just mm. awesome. It is. Hold up the awesome card, Jeremiah. Come on, you've got you've got the you've got the Zoom cards. Hold up the air. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Speaking of awesome, let's um, let's continue. I think I think we have well, not necessarily exhausted the topic, but I hope we have planted enough ideas in our listeners' heads to um, explore this a bit further, and maybe yeah, uh, and maybe do something about we'll... their own future of photography. How about that? Sure. There are so many different workflows that have to do with how we capture what tools we use how we process it what the output is color contrast and uh additions of things like flare (laughs) or objects so um i think the opportunity for photographers uh whether they be uh technically adept or not um all around us are tools that allow us to transform our photography in ways that could be expected or surprising. And I think that Mm. is um, very much in the future of photography. We're going to see editing tools that give us the feeling of being more in control. 
whether we are or not, that's a different <laughs> story. Yeah, and, and apologies to anyone who tuned in uh, based on the title of this episode, hoping that we would give him the silver bullet and all be all workflow <laughs> no, suggestions usual. here. We, so we couldn't really just, do that. Just as confused as ever. Right. Let's go to our picks of the week. Imar, you get to start because you have to leave earliest. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, my pick of the week is uh, this photographer, Dara McGrath. This project was called Project Clean Sweep, and it's going to be our first at South Tip Art Centre uh, exhibition of the year uh, for April, which is a bit late, mm. as everyone might recognize. Um, but this was um, some work that he did in. We've talked about kind of similar type photography before and different work. And I know somebody um, had a very similar thing as pick of the week in one of the episodes. He looks at landscapes that have had like. Uh, chemical waste in them or like nuclear waste now, not instantly recognizable by the images that he chooses to show but it's more about what's going on under the ground or sort of almost um what damage is being done to the the ecosystems and stuff over long periods of time with this stuff leaching into the ground these are great a lot of beautiful mm, a lot of the lo locations in this are were across the UK because I think he was based there specifically at the time. But um, part of the project when he brings it uh, to our gallery will be looking at very similar um, um, locations uh, around this area uh, or anything that kind See, of. Now, if we combine that, to that, if we combine that, combine that photography with Adrian's sci-fi. Kids, um, I think that would be a perfect fit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or Burkitsky, right? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or Burkitsky, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he actually made a book of these images, and it's it's on Google Books. Um, but uh, I just chose this because it shows you a good selection of them here. They're lovely. Something so, yeah. eerie seeing That's these fine. oil drums. Yeah, in, uh, they are in eerie. The landscape. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. It, in yeah. some ways, the, the, the flatness of the light, the snapshot vibe of them. Yeah. The yeah. uh, keep, makes it very, very uneasy, very yeah. documentarian. Huh. Yes, yeah. yeah it's they, also uh, he's trying to raise awareness as well in a lot of it. So, like anywhere that he goes and shows these works, usually um, it causes a little bit of debate in the area and um, um, gives people a chance to maybe address some of the problems that are going on in in local communities. <laughs> on a lesser level i suppose but nonetheless important yeah okay adrian how about yours uh well i have to give you the credit for my pick of the week chris <laughs> because it was you that uh although this is a youtube channel that i i subscribe to as well uh you spotted it and shared the link before i got to it um so uh well i i don't know if it's if it's uh too much of a tenuous stretch to to include um how you sell and and the business of of images in in our workflow discussion uh but this is uh this is the current topic du jour of the non fungible token uh that we've spoken about a little bit <laughs> or at least joked about a little bit um this is a video uh on a youtube channel called corridor crew where the artist Beeple is explaining his early engagement uh, with NFTs and blockchain art. And um, yeah, if you recognize the name, of course, Beeple, since they made this video, had one of his pieces of art, a JPEG, I believe, a JPEG collage, sold for nearly $70 million. Made a big a bit of a splash there, yes. <laughs> made a bit of a splash. Now, that was not his first foray into the whole uh, NFT uh, and art, art sales. Um, uh, he'd already made, personally made, about $3 million. Um, and, and the $70 million one was a secondary sale. So he didn't get $70 million, but he got 10% of that. So in the last four or five months, this guy has made $10 million. Dollars. That's US dollars. That's not he like some Mickey that. Mouse he dollar. He made more than that, Adrian. <laughs> um, that was... Christie sold that, and there was a commission through them. And he... I, I've been following his work for a long time. He's a brilliant artist. But uh, he didn't really know what to do for Christie's. So he put all 5,000 works that he had done every day for years and years and years into a single JPEG. It was purchased by uh, a 
very interesting guy who basically had started blockchain wallets and had made a lot of money in crypto. But he got the bulk of that money, um, believe it or not. Did he? Oh, I thought yeah, he was just on the. I thought because it was it a secondary second, sale. No, it was a principal sale. It was a so. principal sale. Oh, sorry, my my mistake. Okay, just so he will have. <laughs> yeah, and he was the, so so the, the 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 YouTube link is a conversation where he relates some of his early experiences, including a weekend uh, where he first put up, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, some open editions that sold a thousand copies each and things like that, uh, and he made three million dollars in one weekend. <laughs> yeah, and he'd only been doing this blockchain thing three months. <laughs> at the time so yeah but but for those of you uh, listening or watching who've heard a lot about this and are thinking what the hell's going on which i confess i am as well um here is uh straight straight from the uh i was going to say straight from the horse's mouth but it, this is this he's the winner he's just won the blockchain he totally you know if there was <laughs> he's won the blockchain so nobody need bother anymore um and uh <laughs> He's talking about his own experience. Oh, we could, we could, we could uh, mint one of these episodes and sell this for a loan and uh, and auction it off, and then find out how much we're really worth, or maybe not. So, so, maybe not. so that 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 particular <laughs> example, well, not that particular example, that particular idea is addressed in this video, and uh, apparently and sadly, it depends entirely upon how much people are prepared to pay for it. <laughs> and uh, that's that's. The, True yeah, down. the 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 buyer determines the value, not the seller. Um, Jeremiah, you brought us something beautiful. Talk about workflow. I thought I would stick to the theme. Here's a image, single image. Artist creates this beautiful, realistic landscape here. So this is his image. Um, gorgeous impressionist landscape. And if we start to scroll down, we have an understanding of his personal workflow. And I encourage, I encourage everybody go. to really look at it. It's an official. This tank. is how he <laughs> this is how he makes his pictures. Uh, so um, there you go. It's not always done with filters. Oh wow. Sometimes so so it, it's, it includes water and this way he gets like layers and things in there, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Look at that. Yeah. He he, he I think the work is just beautiful and um, yeah. What an amazing, amazing. Yeah, amazing, huh? Incredible a stuff. And wow. there's sort of a workflow in the physical universe, which oh, yeah. is what I. And li I liter liter <laughs> literally work flow because we're oh. talking about water. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yes, fluids. very good. Fluids, yes. Okay, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I love love that stuff. Uh, in fact, just as an aside, when you go to our little TFOP website, there's a image that I did of uh, Mount Fuji, which which is done with a uh, printed 3D printed model yes. maker uh, that I got from Mount Fuji and got to a maker and and then I photographed it in studio, <laughs> made it impressionistic. Talk about a con it. convoluted workflow right there. <laughs> I could have gone to Japan to do it, but I just chose to do it here during the pandemic. <laughs> All right. And uh, Imar had to drop out, but um, we'll wrap this episode up with my pick of the week, which is a technical one again. It is a blog entry from Petapixel about the... Pers Perseverance Mars Rovers cameras, which is mm. really interesting because um, if I'm not mistaken, Perseverance has 23 cameras that it brought on onto Mars. So I don't know how many the other rovers have, but plenty more. Out of those, nine cameras are engineering cameras, um, seven are science cameras, and seven are or were mainly used for the entry and the descent and the landing. Um, to Selfies. <laughs> selfie. Part. Well, the selfie, I think it's the science cameras, probably. So um, we're looking at uh, front and rear cameras that are, I think, mostly for navigation in these things. One dedicated nav cam, and then uh, a super cam, one that's called Sherlock, one that's called Pixel, and uh, the, the kind of two main interesting cameras are the mast cams called mast cam z and that's a pair of cameras because they are stereoscopic 
And um, what you're saying is our phones have got some way to go before they've got sufficient cameras on them. Is that what you're saying? Well, and th <laughs> those are the first cameras on Mars with zoom and with uh, color. So they have an RGB uh, array on them. They can also see some infrared, some UV, and uh, yeah, they are the size of. Um, let me see. I'm I'm going to scroll to a picture of them. So whoever's Has watching, anybody seen the 4K pictures from Mars? They are dazzlingly here, good. Here is the, the two cameras here next to a Swiss Army knife, so you can get an idea of the size. They are kind of a DSLR size, I think, with a long lens on them. So yeah. um, pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. It, it, especially the yeah. mechanism, the zoom mechanism, is on a ball rail so there is no grease or anything in there because if the mars dust would get in there it would just clog everything up and you can't the grease, yeah send someone up to clean them so like a soviet range finder just clogged up <laughs> they can't move anything and this and this is not going to happen there because they did this without any lubricants uh just pure physics and um that's very interesting so with that i think we have uh gotten to the end of this episode we are yeah again we hope that you are at least um let, let's say that your that your uh workflow creative workflow juices are flowing now and that you are uh going to look into this for your own yeah. future photography that's that's our hope and, hmm. uh, yeah well i'm gonna go and off and do some fun workflow stuff <laughs> With friction. With fr with friction? Well, maybe. Maybe with friction. And no lubricants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know. Could be on Mars. They have, I'm pretty sure, and on Mars they have a pretty dedicated workflow there. For their photography. Let's well, anyway. So. Anyway, that's it for this time. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, all. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com.